talk about membership. So we have our first batch of members that are officially members now. Uh, there's not going to be like an intensive ceremony, but we did want to have some sort of a formalized time to recognize those uh, people who have gone through the membership class. Those of you guys who don't know about membership, you're, you're not from a church that practices membership. If you come to the Discover class, we'll get into more detail of what that is and why we do it here. But essentially, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says that anyone who comes into faith in Christ becomes a part of his body, right? What, what that means is that you have been gifted by the Holy Spirit and by just your natural innate temperament with various gifts and abilities that God wants you to utilize to both build up and encourage the other Christians that are members of his body, as well as to bring people into the body of Christ. And so what formalized membership is, is it's just a recognition of that, right? So it's a recognition of you being a member of the body of Christ as a whole, and also your decision to commit yourself to this particular body of Christ here locally. Uh, and that means that you are now free to serve within the body, you're uh, free to uh, integrate yourself in the body a little bit more fully. And that process is, is fairly simple, but like I said, I'll, I'll talk about it at the Discover class if you guys want to come and learn more about that. So I'm just going to read off these names. It's kind of a big list, and I'm terrible at reading names. I'm almost guaranteed that I'm going to mispronounce her name. I'm sorry about that in advance. And it was funny when I was writing these down, I realized that today's study, I was going over a genealogy in the book of Genesis, and I specifically did not put the genealogy in my notes because I'm terrible at this, but one way or the other, I'm going to read off names. Okay, so uh, the first person is Kim Allison, John Getter, Rob and Nina Houts, Ben and Katie Collins, Bob and Cindy Motts, Scott and Jennifer Bosson, John and Megan Lee, Bjorn and Kate Olson, Adam Martinez, Joanna Barton, AJ and Christy Berry, Brent, Kat, Macy and Colby Jackson, Lincoln and Helene Platt, and Gabe, Lorena, Annette, Joe, and Isaac Hernandez. So if you don't already, Mike has your official kind of membership paper, right? And we're working on church merchandise and <laughs> to really bring in the members, you know. So, uh, we were gonna get a t-shirt cannon, but you know, it doesn't, uh, I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so you can get your official paperwork from, from Mike, and like I said, that all that means is that you're officially committing yourself to this particular localized body, and we're committing ourselves to you in reciprocation. So uh, let, let's pray for those members, and we'll move into the study. So Lord, I want to thank you so much for uh, each and every one of these people that has made it their, their call and determination to help out uh, with the work that you've begun here, Lord. We're thankful for that, and I personally am grateful for this ministry, for this church, how you've grown and developed it. It's been such a, a blessing to me and my family, and it's encouraged us so much in our walks with you. So I'm grateful to be a part of it as well, to be a member here, and uh, I do pray for the new members that they would be able to find their place here, that they would be able to serve in the gifts that you've given to them, and that everyone who comes into these doors would be blessed by their, their presence and their passion for you. Uh, we love you, God, and in your name. Amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 4. We're going to finish Genesis 4, and then we're going to actually go through all of Genesis 5. But I've broken this sermon into two sermons. Um, and as I said, I did not put the actual genealogy in my notes. If you want to go later on today and read Genesis 5 and try to pronounce all the names in your own head, you go for it. I'm not going to give a shout up here from the pulpit because it'll just embarrass me. So Genesis 4 verse 25 through 26 says this though, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain has killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and his name was Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. So in the Bible, as I said, there's these lists of what we call genealogies. And in modern Western culture, we don't really have those anymore. In fact, if I were to get with most of you after the service and ask you to name your family tree up a couple generations, you may be able to make it past a couple great grandparents, but maybe not any further than that, right? But back in ancient cultures, genealogies were actually very, very important. Understanding your family tree was very, very important. And even to this day, if you were to talk to Jewish people, their genealogies are very important to them. It's important for them to understand their pedigree, kind of what tribe they come from, and things like that. Um, so 
in the Bible, again, the Bible is written by these more ancient cultures. You're going to have these genealogical lists, these lists of family trees present within the text. Now, you can, and certain pastors do pull out the meaning of the names within the genealogies, but predominantly, I'm just going to give you a little hint of why the genealogies are there. They're predominantly there to tell the story of a particular lineage. That's what they're there for. They're also there to map the eventual line of the Messiah, right? And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, another thing I'm not going to go into today, but is interesting, as some of you guys know, I am a young earth creationist, but there's also a branch of Christianity called old earth Christianity. And in other words, I believe that there is a, a literal element to what's going on in the book of Genesis. And so if you read through Genesis 5, you realize these people live a little longer than we do today. Uh, some of them are like 900 years old and something like that. Now, for a young earth creationist, what that means is I believe that those ages are literal. Now, it's hard to believe. Right? It's hard to believe because we would have to believe that mankind was either fundamentally very different than we are today, or we have to believe that the environment that man lived in was very different than it is today. And there are theories out there. You can find it on Answers in Genesis. They're, they're very fascinating. Uh, the other theory is that these ages are meant to be taken symbolic and not in a literal sense. So if, if, if that sounds ridiculous to you, they do make videos on it. You can go on YouTube and be like, genealogies, the Bible, you know, a old age in the Bible. And people have, and they're kind of convincing. I, I got to admit to you, like I, I watched a couple last week to prep for this. And I was like, that, that actually is not as crazy as I thought it was. So uh, if you're interested in that, if you're interested in the older creationists defending their viewpoint and these old ages, you can look at it. Uh, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's a bit of a, a rabbit trail, but it is kind of cool. We're not going to talk about that. Instead, <laughs> we're going to look at what is the line of Seth meant to communicate to us? What is going on in this genealogy that God wants us to understand about his plan for the human race, his plan for salvation, and his plan for us Today, the main characteristic of the line of Seth is given to us in verse 26, at the very end, it says, Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. This is what Seth's line uniquely starts doing, and this is what people who believe in God can do today. And I'm going to explain why I believe this, but in other words, how this could be articulated is men began to know God by name. That's one of the ways that you could actually translate that sentence. Men began to know God by name. In other words, men began to know God personally. And if you've been around Christian circles for any length of time, it's kind of a cliche, but we say that we don't have a religion. We have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that sometimes is said so often that we don't know what the heck it means anymore. So I thought it would be a good idea to meditate on that. What does it mean that we have a personal relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ? So today we're going to be looking at what does that mean? And next week we're going to be looking at how does that function? So we're going to be looking at specifically prayer and study of God's revelation to us through his word. But let's begin with what it means. So you notice Seth, after he is born, Eve responds and says, For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel. So when the curse occurs in Genesis chapter 3, God sentences man to a fallen existence. But he promises Eve that one of her seed, right, one of her descendants, is eventually going to reverse the curse. He's going to destroy the works of Satan. He's going to crush the head of the devil. As Christians, we believe that that is Jesus. But she is saying that God had in some way communicated to her that Abel was supposed to be the forerunner for the Messiah. And obviously Cain killed him, so that didn't exactly work out. But that was the original intent. Now, Seth, when she's in the word Seth, by the way, means appointed. Any of you guys have the name Seth? Now you know what it means. Appointed, meaning that she sees a new line from which Messiah is going to come. Right? This, this chosen one, this anointed one, this person that is going to actually reverse what Satan did to us within 
the fall. And so when it gets to Enosh, it, we, we see exactly how this line is already getting mankind ready for the eventual Messiah. Because the obvious question we could ask God is, why didn't you just have Jesus be born right away? Right? Why, why didn't Messiah come like the first generation? Why wasn't Abel Jesus Christ? You know, why couldn't we have just gotten this show on the road a lot more quickly? Now, I don't have time to get into this today, but essentially in, I'm going to use a weird example. I'm sorry, it's going to feel a little like school. If you're going to start an experiment using the scientific method, you have to formulate a couple different elements to it in order to make it actually scientific. One thing you have to do is you have to create a control element. Right? So if I'm going to do an experiment of, I don't know, the amount of rainfall in Tucson, Arizona or something like that, and I'm going to compare it to other cities, I have to create a control element. I have to say this is the average amount of rainfall in the country, and then I have to actually measure what happens in Tucson, Arizona in order to compare those two. God is conducting a bit of an experiment. Now, it sounds impersonal, but there's a reason why he's doing it. In the Old Covenant, God is conducting an experiment in order to demonstrate to man that he is God and that his ways are actually good. In order to do that, God needs a control group. Now, this would be called the people of God, right? So he selects a segment of the population and he allows for them to have a personal relationship with him. It begins with Seth and then it moves into Noah and then it moves to a guy named Abraham. And then it moves from Abraham into a guy named Isaac. And then from Isaac, it goes to Jacob, right? And Jacob's name eventually becomes Israel. So the people of God become the Israelites. Now, the reason why God does that is because if God revealed himself to every people group on the planet, the taunt of Satan in the garden would have never been disproven. Satan in the garden, he basically said, did God really say that this tree is going to kill you? How do you know that God's revelation of what is good versus what is evil is actually good or evil? What if you could create a better system of good and evil? That was the taunt in the Garden of Eden. So if God reveals his law to every people group, we would always be able to go back to God and say, yeah, but we didn't have a choice. What if we could have created a better set of morals than you did, God? You know, who is to say that your morality is truly better? Well, now we have the ability of hindsight. I don't know if you've ever looked into your ancestry and seen what kind of stuff they did prior to Christianity permeating the globe, but it's interesting stuff. We'll just put it that way. And ask yourself, right, if you've never done it, go back, figure out what did my great, 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 great grandparents do in relation to one another and ask yourself, would I want to live under this moral system? This is better than what God revealed to the people of Israel. God's control group, in other words, the people of Israel are there to vindicate God's law as being the right law by which mankind is supposed to govern ourselves. That's what this is for. So the different groups that God chooses in the Old Covenant are there to vindicate his will and his purpose for mankind. That's what they're there for. And so he, in our egalitarian society, it doesn't make us too happy that God selects lines, but that's what he does, right? And he does it for a purpose. That's the reason why he does it. So what's this idea that they're calling upon the name of the Lord? Why does the writer of Genesis, who we believe to be Moses, why does he articulate it that way? In the ancient societies and cultures, names were very significant. They were very, very important. And the meanings within names were very important, right? People took it very seriously. In our modern vernacular, we have a type, right? You may hear someone say, I'm protecting my good name or something like that. We obviously are not talking about our literal name. We're talking about our identity, our character, our reputation. To put it more succinctly, in the ancient cultures, the phrase name, when he's talking about someone's name, they're talking about the sum total of someone's character and reputation. So when men begin to call upon the name of the Lord, 
Once again, it means that they're knowing him. They've come in contact with God, very God. They, they understand his character. They understand his reputation. They are personally invested in him. There's another element here that we sometimes miss. If you're reading in your Bibles, you'll notice that the word Lord is in all caps. Some of you know what that is, some of you don't. For those of you who don't know what it is, this is what it is. God had what was called a covenant name with his people. So it's kind of like if you're working at a business or something like that, and you know your boss, and you call him Mr. or Mrs. X and such. And if they want to get to know you personally, what do they say? They say, don't call me that, call me, and they'll give you their name. They'll give you their first name. What that means is I'm entering into a personal relationship with you. I'm taking my professional relationship with you, and I'm putting it in the back seat of a personal relationship that I want to have with you. God did that with his people. Again, this is something that goes by our notice a lot. Most of the names that we use for God are actually titles. They're not names. Right? Even the word God, that's not a name. I don't know if you knew that, right? But God, that's not his name. That's a title. And that's why even in the modern English, we don't have a problem with, say, 2 Corinthians 4, where Paul calls Satan the God of this earth. Right? That doesn't scandalize us because we know what he means. It means that Satan exercises large amounts of authority over the earth. We don't believe he's actually a deity that would be appropriate for us to worship. So when God, we, we call God God, all we're referring to is a title, that God is the one that has total sovereignty and power over the cosmos. Right? Or if you call him Lord, that's the same thing. You're just denoting how God interacts with his creation. That's not his name. But... When God was communicating to his people in the Old Covenant, he wanted to have this personal relationship with them. And so he says, don't call me God, call me, and he gave them a name. Now, we have no idea what that name was. The Jews were so protective of this name that they refused to put vowel pointers in any recording we have of this name. We know the consonants, Y-H-W-H, but we don't know what the vowels were. The best approximation we have is Yahweh. Some people, if you're Germanic, would say Jehovah. But that's a guess, right? We don't actually know what the name's pronunciation was. They were trying to guard the name, the significance of it, by not allowing for specific translations of the name to exist. But that's the idea there. Whenever you see all caps, Lord, in your Bible, that's what's going on there. That's the divine name, the covenantal name of God being given to his people. Okay? Now, this phrase that is here, that men begin to call on the name of the Lord, it also means that when they're calling upon his name, they again, they're, they're having this personal interaction with God. They know him by name. They know him by his first name. This is so important to them, and that is why the second commandment in the law is thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain, Exodus 20, verse 7. This is why Jesus instructs his followers to pray in his name, John 14, verse 13 through 17. And why Paul, in Romans 10, verse 13, says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? So, if, again, if you ever wondered, like, why do we pray in Jesus' name? Right. It's not like an open sesame kind of thing. It's not like God hears like, oh, it's in Jesus' name. Okay, I'm going to do it. What you're saying is I'm praying in communion with Jesus. I'm praying to the Father through my relationship with the Son. I'm praying in his power. I'm praying in relation to Jesus Christ. That's why some Christians actually don't say in Jesus' name at the end of prayer. They say through your Son we pray. Amen. Right? That's what we're denoting. We're saying through the Son, through the ministry of Jesus Christ, we have access to the throne of God, and we now can pray to him, not simply as a Lord or Master or Deity, but we pray to God as a friend. We talk to him in a personal way, a personal context, and we'll talk more about that next week. Now, lest you get disappointed that we don't know what the covenant name of God is, Jesus' name is actually Yahshua in Hebrew. That name literally means Yahweh is salvation. 
So as Christians, we actually do have access to the covenant name of God, but that access happens through the Son. When we call upon Jesus, that's what we're saying. We're calling upon Yahweh through the salvation provided for us in Jesus Christ. We have a personal relationship with God. Now, the other descendants of Seth give us more clues to the eventual ministry of Jesus Christ. Let's take two. We're just going to take two. Enoch and Noah. So in Genesis 5, so I'm not going to read the whole genealogy, but I'm going to read two. Genesis 5, verse 23, it says this, So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. After the fall, this is the first instance in the Bible that gives us a hint that men can walk with God, and that men can be with God forever. But notice how his salvation is depicted. His salvation is depicted as walking with God and God taking him up to be with him. It's very simple. You don't get any rituals. You don't get any law. All you have is that man has the ability to walk with God. We have the ability to know God. We have the ability to be with God. Now, in most religions, pagan or otherwise, they used to have access to the gods. But the access that they had with the gods was impersonal, and it was more likened to like, the relationship you'd have with a king than an actual friend. So in ancient cultures and civilizations, what all of their rituals are, are basically ways by which the people can call upon their gods for help. That's what they're there for. In fact, one of the most famous religions around today is Hinduism. And in Hinduism, it's about a karmic system, right? A system of acts and behaviors from which you can get a divine blessing, a good life, right? To have good karma reign within your world, right? All these ancient religions had the same perspective. God is not an end. God is a means to an end. I pursue God or the gods in order to get some sort of an external prosperity. That's also why in all these other religions, depictions of heaven are so vivid. Right? You read any other religious text and you're going to get tons of depictions of what heaven is like. In the Bible, in the entirety of the Old Testament, do you realize we don't get one depiction of heaven? Not one. And in the New Testament, we only get one. We get the the very end of the book. You you read to the entire end of the Bible, and you get one and a half chapters of a deeply symbolic existence that happens to those who are faithful to God. That's it. The reason why is because the emphasis of the Bible is that heaven is the dwelling place of God. In other words, our reason for wanting to go to heaven is to be with God. That's why the people of God want to go there. It's because of who is there, not what the culture is like. It'd be like if you fell deeply in love with someone who lived in a foreign country, and you long to go there. Your longing to go there would be more about being with the person than the environment that you would live in. So when I was in high school, I thought that Tucson was the ugliest and most disgusting place I've ever been, and I longed to get out of Tucson. Right? So I realized my grades aren't that great. I can't go to some foreign college. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to join the military, which is a great decision for all you kids who want to get out of Tucson. Go into the military. They'll send you all over the place. Right? Maybe not the places you want to go, but you're going to go. Um, and so I, I went into the military, and I got to live in North Carolina, which is gorgeous. Right? North Carolina is absolutely gorgeous. Trees everywhere. Four seasons, the whole nine yards. And eventually, the appeal of being in a really green environment wore off. And then I noticed it gets real cold here, and the humidity is not as fun as I thought it was going to be. And there's a lot of bugs. But honestly, at the core, my dissatisfaction with North Carolina had very little to do with the environment. It was mainly because my family was here. So after I got out of the military, I could have literally gone whatever I wanted. I had the GI Bill, but I chose to come here because my family was here. 
And that connection, that ability to be with my family, made Tucson home. Right? It made it very precious to me. That's what is so cool about God. God is our home. Right? We long to go to heaven because we have fallen in love with God. Every other religion on this earth teaches you to follow the right rituals, the right circumstances in order to go to some sort of a prosperous life here on this earth or to ascend into some sort of a impersonal heavenly existence in which it's hedonic pleasure that is bestowed upon the people and you get whatever you want. Our religion, our faith teaches us that heaven is about knowing God. In fact, Jesus says in John 17, verse 3, he says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What is heaven? Knowing God, being near to God, dwelling with God, loving God. God is not a means to an end. God is our end. To be a Christian means that we're coming to God. To have a personal relationship with God means that is what we want. If you were to ask a Christian, what do you want most out of life? They would say to know God. That's my life. That's what I want to do. I want to know God more so that I might anticipate perfect knowledge of him in heavenly spaces. And that means for the Christian, eternal life begins right now. You can know God right now. We don't have to wait for heaven. We have heaven, a little piece of it, broken off for us in us. Because God doesn't dwell in temples. Right? Back in the day, God would actually dwell in a temple. You would go to a place to be near to God. But for Christians, we believe that God has chosen to dwell in us. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that we are the temple of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in our hearts. He doesn't dwell in some location that we can go ascend to. This is the idea of walking with God, having that intimate, personal knowledge of Him. And it's that personal relationship with God that makes us want to serve Him. Right? So uh, we'll talk more about this in a second, but the greatest changes that have happened in my life have not happened due to fear of consequence. They have happened due to a desire to please those whom I love. I'll change my life a little bit to avoid a ticket, but I'm not going to change it that much. I'm really only going to change it just enough not to get the ticket, to be honest with you. But I will change everything about myself in order to get in deeper intimacy with those I've come to love. Right? Because that's how love works. So Christians, it's not that we serve God less because we do not relate to him through the law and we have this personal walk with him. We serve God more because our relationship with God is not predicated on law, but it's predicated on grace and love and intimacy that we have come to know God and therefore come to anticipate perfect communion with him that will only happen in heavenly places. The second child that we should look at is Noah. So this is Genesis chapter 5, verse 29, and it says this, And he, speaking of Lamech, uh, Noah's father, called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the ministry of Noah as the preceding chapters go. Most people know who Noah is, though, whether they're familiar with the Bible or not. right? So obviously we know that he's going to save the people from a flood. But his name means rest. And when his father names him rest, you see him passing down that messianic lineage to him. He's saying, for he will give our people rest. One of the ministries of Jesus is to give his people rest. And he's not shy about this, right? In Matthew chapter 11, one of the most famous passages in the gospel accounts, Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am easy and meek in heart. 
So Jesus is saying to his people, I am the fulfillment of Noah. I'm the fulfillment of the Sabbath. I'm the fulfillment of all the promises of rest that God has given to his people. I have come to give you rest. A personal relationship with God produces rest in people. Why does that happen? So toil is actually not burdensome to mankind. I've, I've talked about this before, but, but work is not actually burdensome to mankind. In fact, we were created to work. If you want to know how created you are for work, try to do nothing for longer than a week. You'll drive yourself crazy, right? Just try to do nothing today. Just sit on your couch, which some of the teenagers in the audience have just devoted their life to. You just sit on the couch for the next couple hours and just watch YouTube or watch movies or something like that. You'll be exhausted. You'll be so tired. You'll be like, gosh, man, I'm ready to do that again tomorrow. You know, like it, you just want to go to bed because you're not built to do nothing. You're built to work. Work is not what tires us. Work is not toilsome. It's absurdity that is toilsome to us. That's a very specific term. And I'm going to define it. So back in the day, and by back in the day, I mean about 80 years ago or so, a guy named Albert Camus was talking about what it was like to live in an absurd reality. And he wrote a very fascinating book called The Myth of Sisyphus. And it's kind of like a compilation of essays. It's, it's really fascinating, really well written, but he's coming at it from the perspective of an atheist. And what he's talking about is using as a, a example point this myth in Greek mythology called the myth of Sisyphus. Now, Sisyphus is, is debated about how exactly this happened to him, but some people believe he was stealing secrets from the gods. And he was sentenced to a really, really terrible fate. Right? So his fate is he had to take a big boulder, and he had to push it up a hill every day. And when he got to the top of the hill, no matter what he did, the boulder would roll down, and he would have to do it again. Now, what Camus pulls out very wisely is he says, the Greeks conceptualized of hell as being a never-ending series of tasks from which nothing could come from. And he says, this is absurd. This is what it means to be an absurd person. You can go through anything in life, and as long as there's meaning behind it, you can endure. What you can't go through is suffering that is absurd. This is why, by the way, I'm a big comic book guy. My favorite comic book character is Batman, and obviously the best Batman villain is the Joker. Why is the Joker so terrifying? Why is a demonic clown so terrifying to us? Because what the Joker does is he not only makes you suffer, but he laughs at it, right? He makes you suffer in an absurd way. He's telling you your whole life is just absurd, right? That's why, oh gosh, I mean, I'm going to get off a tangent in Dark Knight. I'm not going to do it. But anyway, so <laughs> absurd existence is the thing that we fear and dread the most. Not doing work, but finding out that everything we have done has been meaningless, Finding out that everything that we have done has been meaningless. And what Camus says is that, hate to tell you, but as an, as an atheist, he goes, if you're an atheist, your, your life is absurd. He's like, because eventually you're going to die, and then the sun's going to burn out, and then all of the human race is going to die, and there will be no memory of you, and the oceans of darkness and futility that preceded our tiny little blip of existence on this planet is going to swallow us up, and all that will be left is blackness and nothingness. It's cheerful, right? And he says, so therefore, your life is absurd. No matter what you do, no matter what you accomplish, if you extend the timeline out far enough, you will be forgotten and it will be meaningless. But he gives a really cheery end and he's like, but that's really cool because you're meaningless, but you're free. And he says, so therefore, we must picture Sisyphus smiling, which is that's like the last sentence in the book. It's kind of funny, but that's, that's what he says. It's like, yeah, you know, it's like it's terrible that our life has no meaning. But, you know, the great thing is, is that we have no purpose. And if you have no purpose, that means that you can't live a good or a bad life. You can only just live life. And so be happy about that. You're absolutely free. Now, he could have saved himself a lot of time and just read the book of Ecclesiastes, because in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 13 through 15, Solomon, writing about 3,000 years before Camus, said this, I have set my heart to search out my wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man, by which they may be exercised. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. 
What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. So Solomon concludes, life under the sun. There's no God, if there's no eternity, if there's nothing that comes after this, if your life ends, and it actually ends when you take your last breath, your life is meaningless. And what all these writers are saying, right, both Camus and Solomon, is he's saying, if life just ends, you have nothing but toil to look forward to. But if life continues, then your work has meaning. You have rest. You're set free from the toil of working. This is why we meditate and we fixate our, our eyes and our hearts and our minds on the knowledge that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. We're about to enter into the Easter season. Technically, we're already in it. I don't know if you guys knew we're in Lent right now. Uh, but this is the part of the Easter season. And we celebrate it during the spring for that very cause, because we understand that when nature goes to sleep, right, when it dies in the winter, that is a sign of the futility of our work. Right? The plants, they bring out fruit and they bring out all this life and then they do all of it just to die. But then when they come back, it's a picture of us of the usefulness of life. That just as we go down into the grave, we rise again. Just as Jesus goes into the grave and comes back to life, so we will do the same. And therefore your life is meaningful. To use it simply, some of you guys have gardens because you want to have $600 water bills in Tucson, but you, you have gardens. And in the winter, you watch everything you've worked for all year die. But the reason why you don't see it as meaningless is because in spring, it comes back to life. It comes back to life. And you say, it wasn't meaningless. Right? That toil wasn't useless. You see, what I have worked for in the summer is now coming back in the spring. It's rising again. Now, even in Christianity, though, some people don't fully grasp this. Because if you believe that your life is just, you live, and your whole reason for existence is just to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then you'll ascend into heaven, if that's your gospel message, then guess what? Your life is still futile. Because it means no matter what you do, it's not going to matter. You're just going to go to heaven. And some pastors preach that, like, proudly. It'll be like, everything you do is going to burn, you know? So just like, who cares? Just focus on God and focus on saving people. And that's all we need to worry about. That's not the message of Jesus, thankfully. Thank God. Otherwise, again, everything you do is useless. The message of Jesus is not that he died, went into the grave, and his soul went into heaven. The message of Jesus is that he died, went into the grave, and he rose bodily. What does he say to Thomas? When he first encounters him after the resurrection, he says, look at my hands. Stick your finger in my palm. Stick your hand in my side. The things that Jesus did in his body, even the things he did for us, the marks that he received in order to forgive us for our sins, remain with him. The things that you do in the body will be translated into heaven, whether it is good and will turn into precious stones, as what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, or whether it is evil, and then, thank God, it will just be burned up, right? That's what Paul says. It's like, if you do evil things and you believe in Jesus, he's just going to incinerate that stuff. It's not going to make it into heaven with you. Praise the Lord. But the good things that you do, the good things that you commit yourself to in this life, will be translated into heaven. We don't know how that looks. We don't know what it's going to look like. But we know that it's true. And that makes your life not futile. It makes your life meaningful. Every day that you get on this earth is meaningful. It has purpose. It will make it into heaven. If I choose to love my children today, that will make it into heaven. If I choose to do good at my job today, that will make it into heaven. Right? The friendships that I cultivate, the skills that I develop, the things that I look to love on this planet, those things will make it into heaven in some way. That's a beautiful, beautiful understanding. That brings depth, clarity, and grounding to your life, as opposed to making your life meaningless, which is the one thing that mankind cannot endure. Jesus has come to give us rest. 
rest for our souls. Now, two quick points before we wrap up. Two things that we need to avoid. As beautiful as the sermon is, there's some problems that could come because we're sick and wicked. All right, so the first thing is we could accidentally turn grace into license. So we could be like, well, I know Jesus personally. And so therefore, it doesn't really matter what I do in my body because, you know, the bad things I do will be burnt up and the good things will turn into gold. So therefore, it doesn't really matter if I do a bunch of evil stuff. It's not going to make it with me into heaven. Uh, this was a big fear of a lot of Christians about 80 years ago. Now we're just kind of swimming in it. It's like the water we swim in, and so we don't even notice it anymore. But William Booth, who was one of the guys who founded the Salvation Army, he was probably like the guy that founded the Salvation Army, actually. He said this, The chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, Salvation without regeneration, politics without God, heaven without hell. It's an incredibly prescient statement, right? What he's saying is he was looking at this concept of the personal relationship with Christ spreading. Because if you study church history, things kind of go in waves, right? Doctrines go in waves. So Christians bend towards legalism, and then we go into licentiousness, and we kind of go like that. That's, it's very hard for us to find the middle ground. And so there was a, a large amount of legalism that was permeating the West in the 1800s, early 1900s. And so this message of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ was so important to people. In fact, some of you guys may have ancestry in the South. And in the South, it was basically it was like, if you're born in the South, you're just saved. You know, that's just like, if you're a Texan, you're saved. You know, like that's, that's how people started to think about it. They're like, man, I'm, I'm an American. I live in this state. So therefore, I'm a Christian. That, that was it. And the, the preachers at the time had to be like, no, like it's not about being born in a family. It's not about following a certain set of rituals. It's about knowing God, right? We know God as a person. But now we're bending the other way. We're like, well, Jesus is my buddy, you know? He's my bro, so he'll understand when I do these things, right? When I, when I go and I sin in these ways or I do this or that, and he's already forgiven me, so it's all good. And you may even hear people articulate it this way, where someone's like, hey, yeah, you probably shouldn't be doing that. And they're like, Jesus loves me. True, he does love you. I'm not going to argue that point. But he doesn't like what you're doing. In fact, he kind of hates it. Right? And he hates it because he loves you. In our modern culture, it's hard for us to even conceptualize that love can produce discipline. That love actually is supposed to produce Fidelity. So like I said, many people, they think of this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and they're like, this is a license to sin. It's a license to do whatever I want. And they don't understand that, no, 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 a loving relationship with God has more requirements on you, not less. Right? If God is simply a giant judge in the sky, that's all he is. Then he's given you commandments, and all you have to do is follow them. And that's it. You just follow them to the letter, and you'll make it into heaven. And now you're relating to God through a list of commands. You don't have a loving relationship with him, but you have a legalistic relationship with him. Good on you. However, now that we're in a loving relationship with God, like I said, it's, it's like my relationship with my wife. I have given up a lot in my life to follow laws. Right? That's what it means to be a citizen of the United States. And when I was in the military, I had a lot of laws that I had to follow. But it was always surface level. It never went into my heart, and I always just did the bare minimum, right? Because that's what the law is. The law doesn't give you credit. You're never going to drive on the road, and a cop's going to pull you over and be like, you know what, you were doing so good. I can't, I've never seen someone stay in the speed limit like that, you know? The way you signaled two car lengths, good on you, gives you a $5 bill. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. The law can't reward you. It can only punish you. So there's no motive, there's no incentive to do above and beyond for the law. So most of us don't. However, in a loving relationship, it's not just the wrongs that are called out, but it is the rights that are encouraged. When I do right things in my family, my wife meets me with love and acceptance and joy. And it's beautiful. And it makes me go above and beyond. It makes me want to do more for my family. Now, again, there's that sick, wicked part of me that doesn't want to do that. But 
naturally, when I'm being motivated by love, that's what I want to do. I want to go above and beyond. The law could never get you there. The law could only get you to the bare minimum. That's why it's so important for us as Christians to understand personal relationship with God. It is not lowering the standards of God. It is raising the standards of God. When Jesus comes and he gives his interpretation of the law in the Sermon on the Mount, it's higher than what the Pharisees were saying. It was not lower. And he does it because he had come to know us personally. That's what it means to know God personally. Now, the good news is, is if you violate his law, he will treat you as someone would in a relationship. Once again, if I'm relating to a judge and I break the law, they have to meet me with the law. That's the only way they can meet me. In a relationship, somebody can meet me with forgiveness. They'll, hope, they'll help me to move towards repentance for my own good and for the good of the relationship, but they can meet me with forgiveness. They don't have to punish me for what I've done. That's what God does. He gives us a relationship with him in which he can reward us for the good, but also call us to repentance and discipline us for the bad. But we no longer relate to him as through the law, which is the second mistake that we can make, turning to legalism. Now, it sounds so weird because you're like, why would anyone give up a personal relationship with God for legalism? Just read the Old Testament. People do it all the time, and it blows God's mind. He is like constantly perplexed. One of the most, I guess you could call it like uh, descriptive books of what this is like is the book of Hosea. And if you read the book of Hosea, God has a faithful prophet marry a prostitute. And he's like, that is what my relationship with you is like, right? My relationship is a loving husband and I care for you and I love you and I'm there with you. And you're turning to gods, you're turning to deities that treat you as if you're just a client. I mean, they're, they're just a client and you are just being selling them your bodies in response for something. It's like you're being abused by these gods and you don't even think to call out to me. The heart of man is a heart that desperately wants to justify itself. We don't want, deep down, we do not actually want the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is you could never be good enough for God. That's the message of the gospel. Never. You could fulfill all the commandments with your body and your heart would still be far from God. You will never be good enough for God. And there's a part of us that wants so desperately to be accepted because we're worthy that we cling to legalism as a means of self-justification. So it is a very much a temptation for us to go back to the law as opposed to having a personal relationship with God. The Apostle Paul, when he's talking to the Galatian church, when they fell into this error, he says this, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? Be careful when you start seeing your relationship with God become only summarized by the bad things that you're not doing and the good things that you are doing. Your relationship with God should be defined by the intimacy that you share with him. If you were to ask yourself that question tonight of like, how is my relationship with God going? How would you answer that question to put it another way? Would you say, well, my relationship with God is going really great because I'm doing this, 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 and I'm not doing that and that and that. Right? If that's your answer, or my relationship with God is really terrible because I am doing these things and I'm not doing these things. Either way, what it shows is that you're relating to God through the law. That's what you're doing. You're defining your relationship with God based on your accomplishments and your failures, and you're not defining your relationship with God based on your nearness to Him. But the correct answer should be, I feel near to God because I'm pursuing Him. And part of that pursuit is working on areas of my sin and cultivating virtue, but that's not what my relationship with God is. My relationship with God is pursuing a God who has come near to me through His Spirit. So today, we're about to take communion. It's good to remember that. Right? That when we take communion, that's what we're communicating to our souls. When we, we take of the bread, we're remembering, it's not my body that's going to get me into heaven. It's only the crucified body of Jesus that is represented in the bread 
and my partaking in that crucifixion through my faith that is going to make me to heaven. And that's why we eat it. That's why we take it into our bodies, because we're taking God's salvation into ourselves. And when you're drinking the wine, you're remembering, it's not my human blood. It's not the the thing that animates my veins. That is never going to make it into heaven. The only thing that's going to get me into heaven is if the blood of Jesus is sufficient to wash my sins and make me clean before God. And you take that into yourself and you remember it. And for that reason, as I said before, the communion elements are available and open if you've already accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you have a personal relationship with God, that is why you take the elements. It doesn't make you more right with God. It's not a work, but it is something that motivates, it cultivates, it grows intimacy with God for those who already believe. So this is a passage that I was reading this week, and I hope it blesses you guys and drives this point home. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 14. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're grateful for you. We're thankful for the ministry of your Son. Lord, that you you came, you died for us, you've forgiven us through your body, through your blood. Lord, and by that, we now have access to you. Or we don't just relate to you as a God anymore, but we relate, relate to you as a friend, a father, one who loves us and has drawn near. Help us, God, to respond to that grace, to respond to that love in a dignified way that we might live our lives in a way that demonstrates love, that demonstrates joy, that demonstrates peace in you. God, help us to do that in your name. Amen. Amen.